Welcome to today's Bible study from College Lutheran Church and from me, Pastor David Drebus. It's good for us to study God's Word, and we continue to do that using this list of the top 100 essential Bible passages. Uh, we come today to passage number 42, A Call to Repentance, from Joel chapter 2. There's a lot of fantastic imagery in the book of the prophet Joel. He writes of swarms of locusts attacking the people. He writes of threats from outside that cause the people of God to realize their own sinfulness and their need to repent to the Lord. Now, I find it interesting that that is the theme of the prophet Joel, and that in addition to that being the theme, uh, scholars argue about when exactly Joel wrote these words. Uh, some say it was as long ago as 600 years before the time of Christ, and some say it was closer to the time of Christ, maybe 350 years before Jesus I think the fact that we have such a span for when Joel might have written these words is um, just a reminder that there is always a need for repentance and that there are always uh, threats to the people of God. So it's unfortunate, but it is true that the message of this book is always going to be relevant for God's people. Now, that need for repentance is always um, a need uh, in every time and every place for every people. And yet, in verses 12 and 13, we have a nice, uh, helpful spin on what repentance truly means. So the Lord speaks here and says, Yet even now, turn back to me wholeheartedly with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. And I like that turn of phrase because it fits with something we'll see in uh, some readings coming very soon. Uh, the prophets around the time that Joel was writing uh, really began to criticize ceremonial um, acts that weren't backed up with, um, with actions or with heartfelt uh, grief over one's sins. You know, what is repentance if it's only a ritual is um, part of the message of what Joel is saying here. And we'll see it in the words of Amos, where Amos says, you know, don't bother with um, having a ceremony if uh, you're trampling on the widow and on the poor among you. You know, what? what's the point of uh, the grand ceremonies if it's not backed up with um, caring for those in need? What's the point of having a ritual of repentance like tearing your clothes if it's not coming from a heartfelt place of repentance? So that's a pr prophetic train of thought that we'll see in some future readings as well, but we see it here in the words of Joel. Um, now, Verse 13 goes on with some important words. Rend your hearts and not your garments, and turn back to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, long-suffering and ever-constant, ready always to relent when he threatens disaster. I like that phrase, that our God is long-suffering. He suffers because he has pledged himself uh, to his people, and yet his people disobey his purposes, which is to um, share with others uh, his, his promise, and, um, and to take care of each other, and, and to be a light to the nations. And so there's a conflict that's uh, located within um, God as we know him, that, um, that he both must be faithful to these people, and yet the people he's promised to be faithful to aren't always faithful back to him. They're not always faithful to each other. And so what does God do with that conflict? Well, God is a forgiving God. And that uh, switch in chapter 2 starts in verse 18. Uh, the Lord showed his ardent love for his land and was moved with compassion for his people. And so that's sort of a, a switch in tone for this chapter. We have the turn to forgiveness. A turn that leads to uh, some verses I really have always been drawn to uh, for a very long time, starting at verse 28. This prophetic word about what, uh, what will happen as um, the world is mended with God's forgiveness. After this, I shall pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men see visions. I shall pour out my spirit in those days, even on slaves and slave girls. Uh, that's some interesting language. It's language I was pointed to in my college days uh, by some rather... Uh, 
theologically conservative Christian friends of mine, but they pointed to this text as a reason for why they supported women in ordained ministry. And I found that interesting because uh, everywhere else I, I look, uh, when I see a theologically conservative Christian, I tend to see people who don't believe that women can be pastors. And yet, uh, for these friends of mine who took the Bible quite literally, they said, well, this is um, part of the promise of God, that eventually God's Spirit will be poured out on everyone, and therefore everyone will be preaching. And so they thought women preachers uh, sort of fit into the paradigm uh, described here by Joel. So just an interesting way about how different people read the Bible. So of course in the time of Joel, uh, women were not priests, and in the time of the early church, women were not priests or pastors. I'm glad we live in a time today and that I serve in a denomination where women are pastors. And I'm glad that even someone who reads the Bible quite literally can come across a passage like this and uh, recognize that God's Spirit is meant to be poured out on all people, um, regardless of their social status, regardless of their gender. And uh, that is what we see here in the words of the prophet Joel. It makes me wonder if um, this is sort of the next step. Um, not so much that the Holy Spirit needs us to act a certain way, but um, I guess what I'm getting at is, does the act of repentance and forgiveness between the people of God and God make room for the Holy Spirit to then be poured out on all people. Um, I wonder if that healing work has to happen first, that healing work of repentance must happen before uh, the Spirit is poured out on all people. Um, and then all people are preaching the word of the Lord and, and seeing visions and, and dreaming dreams. Um, that's very much on my mind, and um, I would invite you to think about that as well. Where is the healing needed in your life, in your community? Um, not because the Holy Spirit is depending on you uh, to fix things, um, but just so that there is room for the Holy Spirit uh, to work more fully uh, in and among us. Uh, I think that's a good thought for us to end with today. Uh, may the Spirit of God be with you.